Uh, my name is Jason Van Tassel. I'm an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, and I've been practicing in Northern California for the past 20 years. Uh, one of my subspecialties of care that I'm particularly interested in is in sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is a condition that affects lots of people. And today we're going to discuss the causes of sleep apnea and some of the treatments that exist for it and some of the health consequences that are related to it. So sleep apnea is actually a pretty serious health condition. It affects probably up to about 10% of the population. It's worse now because we have more obesity in the population, though obesity is kind of a small contributor. Uh, sleep apnea can raise your risk of having a stroke, heart attack, or a fatal heart arrhythmia where your heart doesn't beat right and can result even in death. So in patients that have severe obstructive sleep apnea, the risk of death is twice the general population, and so over long periods of time, it has significant health consequences. So obstructive sleep apnea affects both children and adults, and um, affects almost as many women as it affects men. Obviously, um, people that are heavier have a higher incidence of sleep apnea, but that is just a small contributor. Uh, for the most part, it's a physiologic phenomenon where when we breathe while we're sleeping because we have insufficient kind of the muscular tone of our upper aerodigestive tract through which the air passes through when we're breathing, um, it just collapses. And that's for a variety of reasons. One of the important things to understand about sleep apnea is that its effects on you when you're not sleeping. Um, there are a lot of hormonal effects that happen when people have sleep apnea. Uh, number one, when you're fatigued, if you've had a bad night's sleep, whether you have sleep apnea or not, the next day, and if you have sleep apnea, that's every day, your body makes too much cortisol. And those stress hormones cause several things. It causes us to gain weight, and it causes us to also desire things that may be not in our best interest to eat. And the net effect of the hormones also is to sort of make your body a little bit, it changes its sensitivity to insulin. And so you're gonna have a higher tendency to gain weight, and it makes it more difficult to lose weight, sort of propagating the problem in the first place and making it worse over time. So the, the way most patients come to my office with regards to um, sleep apnea is they usually have a spouse or a family member or a friend that they've traveled with that says, oh my gosh, you snore like a freight train. Even patients that have mild to moderate snoring often will have some degree of sleep apnea. Um, a lot of people that come in do note that they wake up in the middle of the night. Others don't seem to be disturbed in much in any way. From the standpoint of symptoms, uh, things that are kind of like telltale signs for, for sleep apnea would be waking up feeling like you didn't have a great night's sleep on a very frequent basis. Uh, morning headaches are often uh, associated with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, patients will have a lot of fatigue in the afternoon. Some patients with severe sleep apnea have a hard time driving. They fall asleep while behind the wheel. Um, some patients will even fall asleep even while they're having a meal. Um, so it can be quite severe. Um, some patients will fall asleep at work, which is why sleep apnea can be quite hazardous. And so for instance, in a patient that has significant sleep apnea, your blood oxygen saturations already come down some because you're not breathing. You're essentially underwater. And now your body is releasing these hormones, which is gonna wake you up, but is also gonna make your heart race after you've essentially been holding your breath for a minute. And so over time, it can cause scarring and can affect the way that the, the impulses travel through the heart. And so that can lead to abnormal heartbeats, uh, can lead to abnormal heart rhythms, can lead to, uh, which can lead to a heart attack or even a stroke and then death. So there are a multitude of treatments for sleep apnea. Um, once a patient comes in for an evaluation, uh, they are usually sent for a sleep study. And 
depending on the sleep study, uh, we'll make recommendations about what are the appropriate treatments. Invariably, CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure is recommended first because it's the gold standard. If you can tolerate CPAP and wear the mask to sleep and get a good night's sleep with that, that's all that you need. Beyond uh, CPAP, there's a a little bit more of a sophisticated uh, system which is called BiPAP, which is like CPAP in that it sort of senses when you take a breath and then gives you a little extra to open up the airway. Some patients can't tolerate CPAP and some patients can't tolerate BiPAP and so those patients are the patients that I tend to see. Um, and then outside of uh, wearing a mask, which at night, sometimes we'll use an oral appliance to move the jaw forward a little bit to alleviate the obstruction. And in mild to moderate sleep apnea, it can be very effective. And so beyond those two, then you start looking at surgeries to um, open up the airway. And we do a number of surgeries in our office that involve opening up the nose, which sometimes can just enable patients to tolerate the CPAP better. Uh, beyond that, there's a whole other set of technologies that is fairly new, which is a, a little implant that goes in your chest. And it's a controller box, much like a pacemaker. So one of the things that has been uh, looked at for the treatment of sleep apnea is just doing exercises. And there are lots of myofascial exercises because one of the factors that contributes to sleep apnea is not having enough muscular tone when you're sleeping. So if you can improve the muscular tone and strengthen those muscles, even just some, uh, you can often reduce the amount of obstruction that you have. So sleep apnea affects approximately 10% of the population. And of those 10%, probably eight in 10 people never are even diagnosed and just live with it their whole lives. If you think you have sleep apnea or have severe snoring, it's worthwhile that you talk with your physician to see if you can get evaluated for sleep apnea.